So we're going to do a few beautiful things today. We're even going to meditate a little bit. Don't worry. I'm going to like wade you into the water. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to take you right back out. So you don't feel like, what is this? It's too much. Um, I'll do a little meditation. We're also going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that will hopefully rewire some of that stuff in the subconscious that's not serving us. And I'm also going to tell you a few stories because you know how much we learn through storytelling? It's almost like everything, right? Like when you're a kid, why do you love Winnie the Pooh? Why do you love? It's like so much of what we've learned about the world is from the stories our parents told us, right? I remember my mom telling me the story of my grandfather and he died really young and he smoked cigarettes. And so later in life, when my friends were in eighth grade, like, hey, you want to try a cigarette? I was like, I remember the feelings of all of these things I heard about this story. And I just would never have even thought of it because I heard that story from such a young age. So stories really are helpful because we see ourselves and we feel so much in the story more than we do from just facts, right? So I'm going to tell you a few stories that will hopefully really cement some of these ideas. And I think that's going to be fun. So one of the stories I want to start by telling you is my story, because a lot of you know me, but some of you don't. And I wanted to dive in yesterday and just get right to like some of the meat and potatoes. But I thought maybe today it's a good idea for those of you who don't know me to just get a tiny little piece of who is this girl and what is her story. And so real fast, the, the quick the quick version of it is um, just growing up, I was like one of those kids who knew Ah, oh, there's got to be something more than this, right? Who relates to that? Type of one in the chat. And my parents were really unhappy. They had a really hard marriage. There was a lot going on in the house. There was a lot of violence in the house. I felt really scared. I would hear my dad turn the key to come in, you know, at, in the evening when he'd come home from work. And my whole body would just get so tense because there was a lot of, there was just a lot going on in the house that was really hard to, to be around. And I wanted to just be one day as far from there as possible on every level, right? And so I used to go in my room and use my imagination and I would line up my dolls and take a spoon and take a hairbrush and have a concert and sing to my dolls. And I was always songwriting, like that was always something I would do. Sometimes I would take the tape, you know, remember those double cassette tapes and you'd press, what was it like record and play at the same time, I think, and you could record yourself or you could record songs on other songs. Anyway, I would make radio shows and I would sing into the tape recorder and I thought everybody did that, but I think some people did that, but not everybody was writing songs, but I was always doing that. And that was my escape, which was, it was a healthy, I think a good, good habit of an escape. And then my parents got divorced and then my things went from bad to even worse. And my mom was really, really just so depressed and was really struggling with really hard stuff. And a lot of times she didn't want to be here anymore. And there were some really hard moments. And when my dad left, he really left. And he left to the point of he got married. I didn't know that he got married. He had a new family. I wasn't around. I wasn't included. I didn't know about it. So I felt, I don't know how many of you have seen the musical Dear Evan Hansen, but it's my favorite musical. I've seen it three times. I saw it with Ben Platt on Broadway. And I really related to this kid who it's just a regular kid, but his dad moved to Colorado and his mom's doing the best she can, but he really internalizes feeling very much not, not a priority because, you know, that leaves a, that leaves a impression on a kid. And so I was going through that and we moved into this little apartment. My mom was a single mom. Some days we didn't have electricity. I remember that. So I got a couple jobs. 15 was riding my bike to Blockbuster Video. And I would take that job because I could be there till like midnight and I wouldn't have to come home. And uh, I also got to have Twizzlers. And uh, remember those clam shells? The, the videos would come in. I had to take a whole stack of them and put them on shelves. And I remember that now would we ever go to a video store? It's just so funny. I tell my kids, what was your first job, mom? I'm like, you wouldn't relate to this at all. Um, remember what a treat it was to walk through the aisles of Blockbuster Video for like two hours? You remember that, Colleen? Like, ooh, mm -hmm. which movie are we going to get, right? And you pay late fees if it's late, which is so funny. So anyway, that was me. And I started reading books. I started reading Don Miguel Ruiz and Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra. And I was just searching so much. I felt very, very alone. And I wanted so much to know, like, why are we here? Like, why do people grow up to be this unhappy? Like, why do people go to high school to get good grades, to go to college, to 
get a job, to get a 401k, to get married, to have a family, and then you're this miserable. Like this doesn't feel like that's worth it, right? And um, I barely graduated from high school. I had horrible grades in high school. And in fact, my homeroom teacher, Mr. Jack, shout out if you can hear this from anywhere. Um, I wasn't supposed to graduate because I had so many unexcused absences. And if you have, I think it was over 11 unexcused absences to show proficiency, you had to get an A on every final exam or else you don't pass that year. You have to do it again. So here I am, my senior year, I have 16 unexcused absences. And he says to me, you need to get an A on every exam. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to do that. And so I worked so hard for six weeks. I'm just like working on it, you know, as hard as I can. And the morning of graduation, he says, meet me in my homeroom and we'll go over your grades. And I'm like, this isn't feeling great because my friends are already like in their cap and gown on their way with their families. And I'm like going to the school and I walk in the room and he hands me a stack of a few papers and a few exams that I all had to get an A on. And he says, you, you didn't make it. But a couple of them, you came really close. And this one, you actually got a C. And I just start, I can remember right now, just, I just started to cry because I had to get out of my house. My mom was really not doing well. And there were nights that ambulances were called and my dad wasn't around and he wasn't going to be at my graduation. And I was just in so much pain. And he looked at me and he took out a red pen and he said, I'm going to change your grade. And he put an A on every single piece of paper. And he said, get your butt to graduation. So I went to graduation. <laughs> and then I needed to go to college because I had to get out of my house. And like, that would be my way because there's this thing called financial aid, right? And then it's amazing. You can actually live in a dorm, take out a student loan. That was gonna be my saving grace. And so I literally the next day got in the car. I had not applied to college. I lived in Florida at the time. I drove up to UCF, UF, <laughs> both colleges were like, nope, sorry, no, uh-uh. And I drove all the way up to the furthest, which was in Tallahassee, Florida State. And I went into the admissions office and they looked at me like, these grades are, and I just broke down because it was my last stop <laughs> on, the, on the list. And the woman said to me, listen, if you can start on Monday, which was in three days, I can put you on academic probation and you can do summer session. And if you get straight A's, you can stay for the fall. And I like kissed this woman. I was like, you don't understand. And she was like, you ready? And you're going to sign a student loan. I was like, oh my God, I'm an adult. I'm 18. I can do this. Blah, blah, blah. And off I went into my dorm and I worked my butt off and I really found my way. And I actually became editor in chief of the college newspaper, which was like the beginning of Kathy Heller, like starting to do what I do now. In fact, I was in college during the year 2000 and that was when the big election, right? The Gore Bush election. And there was actually like a thing with the Florida ballots and they had to come out and which way is the election gonna go? And so I was actually on the Capitol floor as the student journalist that night and Al Gore was gonna do one story to put on the wire. And the wire means like they'll do one interview and then everybody else can run the story. And so everyone wants to get the interview and there's CNBC and CNN and ev everyone's there. Like the whole world was watching. And um, he said, is there a student journalist here? And he apparently, I mean, now a lot of people know this but he went to Columbia for journalism. And so he wanted the student journalists. And so I, raise my hand. I could like cry thinking about this moment. And he goes, let's go. You get the story. And I sat down with him and I like could not speak. I was just in tears and I interviewed him <laughs> and it went on the wire and it was just amazing. I wound up graduating with honors. I studied uh, comparative world religions and I just fell in love with the world and I was on a search for meaning and boy, did I find it. I was studying all the Southeastern Asian religions like Buddhism, Sikhism, Hinduism, Taoism. I studied Christianity and Judaism and Islam. And I saw meaning and philosophy and the reasons why people actually do grow up to live on this planet and what we're here for and what the why is. And 
how all these people in the world from all different parts of the world connect to this thing called God and energy. And oh my goodness, it was all so similar. I, I actually wrote my senior paper on Moses and the Buddha because they both grew up in a palace and then they both went into the wilderness and then they both led people to this feeling of truth and peace and connection. And it was just such a cool experience. And then after college, I um, thought about applying to rabbinical school. So I did do that. I wound up going to Jerusalem. I deferred that for three year, uh, for a year. And I wound up staying in Israel for three years and studying mysticism. And I, uh, I just, that was like hitting control, alt, delete on my life. Talk about re rewiring your subconscious program, living in the old city of Jerusalem, walking 3000 year old steps and studying with such incredibly wise souls, such kind souls, such loving souls. I learned something, uh, which I'm going to tell you right now. It's a great line. You are a masterpiece. You are a piece of the master. And that's it. And that's the truth. And learning that after spending four years learning all of the world religions, I knew, I knew it like it wasn't just something you hear, you know it, you embody it, you live it. I knew it more than I even know my own name, that that was true, that we are inherently worthy, that we are not just worthy, that we're needed, that every soul comes to this world because you've been assigned, because no one else can be you. No one else can do it your way. Even twins have different fingerprints. And that is a clue that each person leaves a different imprint in the world. And so to say that that healed so much of what I had experienced as a child and my lack of connection with my dad and even with my mom who had been in her own really, um, really intense place of, you know, of pain, right? So she really couldn't be there for me because she was really in her own, her own pain. It really was just the most healing nourishment that I could ever get. And all I wanted to do at that point was to hand that out to people um, and to remind people that they are so extraordinary and that they are so needed. And I had this desire to write music still. And um, the Kabbalist that I studied with said to me, so go to, go to LA and write music. And I said, but, but I live here and it's so special and it's the holiest place. And he said, yeah, but if God had a refrigerator, your picture is smack on the front of it. And you don't need to be anywhere or do anything to be loved. Remember, just go where you want to go and do what you want to do. And so I set off on my way to LA and um, I knew these principles, right? These tools, this thing called the world and how we're all connected. And so it's interesting because I had friends who would be so intimidated to sit down with the head of a record label. And I'm like, how are you intimidated? Like, he's a soul and you're a soul. Like, how is anyone better than anyone? Like, what does that mean? And our superpower is like coming from that place of love and presence. And when you walk in the room with that, it's done. Like you won, you won Charlie Bucket, you win the whole thing, right? It's just like, so I came there with that. And so I, here I come not knowing anybody, right? I have this old beat up Volvo. I have no money. I get a silly job, right? Whatever, just to pay the bills. I was working in a casting office, um, casting a pilot for a show called The Ghost Whisperer. I saw the job on Craigslist and I'm writing music at night and I'm writing songs and they're getting better and they're getting a little better. And sure enough, I get a record deal at Interscope and I'm sitting next to Lady Gaga. No joke, she's recording paparazzi for the VMAs and Ron Fair is like, Cap, what do you want from Starbucks? And I'm like, this is incredible. This is insane. And all my songs were sort of just layered in words that were all about like how every one of us has this magic and this gift and da 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 and I couldn't believe it right and um about two months later I'm driving and I had a new car so I had a I had gotten a little advance and I was driving this blue little sob I don't even think they make sobs anymore which is too bad because they were such cute cars and I get a call from Ron he's like are you driving I'm like yeah he's like call me when you get home. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm pulling over. I get off at Bundy um, on the 405 or the 10, the 10. And I get off 
And I say, tell me. And he says, Jimmy Iveen loves you. Everyone loves you. Like you come in the room and everyone goes, Kathy, oh my gosh, she's so sweet. When I leave her, I feel so good about life. And I'm like, that, thank you. But where is this going? He's like, the music is just not making sense. Like nobody on the AR team thinks that we can sell this music. It's not quite top 40. You know, I signed Vanessa Carlton, remember? Making my way downtown, walking fast and I'm homebound. Anyway. He's like, so I signed Vanessa. So I was like, I got this. I got this girl. I understand her. And they're all like, no, like we need top 40. So he's like, Kath, I know that our paths will cross again. You have such a spark in you. I'm like hysterical. Like, oh my God, what am I going to do from here? So I speak to a friend of mine and she's like, you know, if you're here and you need to make money, this dream, like you have to give it up. Like you're never going to have this dream. So you should just make money. And I said, so how do you do that? And she goes, well, people who make money, they either work in finance or real estate. So you should work in real estate. And I was like, okay, great. And you can feel my soul starting to like die a death. And a few days later, I was in line at the Cheesecake Factory and I meet this guy and he's got a good personality. And he's like, you, you got something. What do you do? What are you about? And I was like, I mean, I tell my story. He goes, I own a billion dollars in commercial real estate. I own shopping centers. I own this. I own that. Why don't you come work for me and I'll I'll pay you well and you'll just be a part of it. I'm like, okay, real estate, commercial real estate. This makes sense. And here I go, you guys, me. Can you picture me in a suit, double breasted, <laughs> high heels? I'm like, how are you doing? And I'm driving to Brentwood every day and I'm working in this office and he's paying me $200,000 and he's giving me bonuses. And I buy this, not buy, but I rent this cute little apartment in Beverly Hills with this gorgeous window. And I buy a couch from Anthropology and I'm eating sushi every night. And my friends are like, oh my God, you're the luckiest person. And I'm like, I don't really feel so lucky. <laughs> and one day I was walking from my office, like the, the elevator doors to my office in the building. And I see myself in the elevator doors and I'm like, I don't even recognize her. I don't know who she is. And I just broke into tears. There's a lot of tears in the story. And um, I quit. I quit. And it's funny because I didn't know what I was going to do. And I always thought that it was like Beyonce or bust. Like either you have this dream and somebody chooses you or nothing. But I forgot, like, you don't need anyone to choose you. You have the greatest thing in the world. You have Times Square version of energy inside of you. Like, what are you waiting for? So there's a Rumi quote, what you seek is seeking you. And next thing I know, I'm like, there's gotta be another, because I quit. I was like, I need to figure it out. I don't have parents that are gonna help me. And my, the money I had is eventually it's gonna run out. It's not like I had tons of savings, right? I was spending it. I was living by myself in an apartment in Beverly Hills, spending money, buying really beautiful suits. But I had a little bit, but like it was going pretty quickly. And I'm like, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. And so I, I heard this quote, what you seek is seeking you. And I decided I'm going to pick up a billboard magazine. And I read an article about all of these indie artists who were licensing songs to Old Navy commercials, McDonald's commercials. They were writing songs for Dawson's Creek for One Tree Hill. I'm like, wait a minute. What does it mean to license music? Maybe I could license music. What is that? And I thought, I'm going to do that. Light bulb, I'm going to do that. So I took my last two years of making cold calls. And instead of cold calling investors, I start cold calling Paramount, Disney, Nickelodeon, ABC, different ad agencies that were doing the ads for all these big brands. I'm calling ad agencies in San Francisco and Minneapolis and I'm breaking my teeth on it, right? I'm figuring it out. I'm uncomfortable, but I'm like, I can do this and I'm going to be uncomfortable because it's worth it. And next thing I know, so here's me. This is a billboard magazine from 2013. And no, that's not me. <laughs> There's me. I actually think that skirts from anthropology. And uh, it says unknown songwriter, Kathy Heller made twice the U.S. household median income last year through her talent and persistence. Here's how she did it. This came out in 2013. And then this is another one. Here's me in Variety Magazine. This is from 2015. It says, trying to crack the music licensing code? Ask Kathy Heller. From Gammon to Guru. And this is like a whole page, you know, article. So these articles started in 2011. I think the first full page story about me ran 2011 in the LA Weekly. Then it was Music Connection. And for years, literally for years, people start writing these full page stories. And I'm saying to the, to the editor, why is this so compelling to you? Like, 
I write music for TV shows. I write, but like, you know, you have like Justin Bieber, you have, and they kept saying, it's compelling because you don't have an agent. Like no one's doing it for you. You're not on a label. You don't have an agent. You're making $400,000. How the hell do you do? Who do you think you are? You know? And I was like, ah, I see. So I thought that at that point, all these other record labels were going to come knocking. Hey, Kath, we want you back. And um, that's not what happened. <laughs> but what happened instead is that every time there was an article written in one of these big magazines, I would get emails from people. Hey, I'm a songwriter and I don't know how the hell you're doing this, but would you teach me how to do this? Can you share anything with me? I'd love to take you to coffee. And so I started having coffee with songwriters and just sharing it and sharing it and sharing it. And next thing I know, my husband's like, don't you think since you now have like a child, like you should do this maybe as a business. Like you can't just keep spending hours and hours and hours. And maybe this is a second business as you can help people with the business of making their dream come true. And I was like, oh my God, that's so insulting. Like I'm an artist. I am an artiste. I don't teach people, right? There's like a, a, a line in a, an Annie Hall where he says, those who can't teach, uh, those who can't do teach and those who can't teach, teach gym. And it's a really mean joke because there's some really cool gym teachers. But the point being that if you're an artist, you want to be an artist. You don't want to teach, right? But next thing I know, I was like, why am I saying no to this? This is maybe the next big yes. Like maybe I should just be generous, raise my hand and do it. And maybe it's a yes and, right? Like Amy Schumer, she writes and she directs and she's also producing and she's also doing stand-up. Like why does it have to be one or the other? So I decide I'm gonna host a little workshop in my living room, invite 10 people over, make it up, just going to talk, just going to share, just going to answer questions, right? Next thing I know, they're like, we want the next workshop. We now have the next workshop. So next thing I know, I start renting a theater. Now there's 50 seats. They're all filled. I'm charging $100 a seat. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like, yes, I was making maybe $50,000 or $75,000 to write a song for McDonald's, but to be able to make $5,000 by having a workshop for two hours, I was like, this is really fun. So I keep doing it. I keep doing it. And next thing I know, I started to go on other people's podcasts who had music podcasts, who had podcasts for people who were in the creative arts. And I'm speaking on this person's podcast and I get a note from one of his listeners. And she says, you should have an online program because I heard that you have workshops, but they're in Los Angeles and I can't get to LA. And I'm like an online class. Oh my God. Like everything about the internet it's like bro marketing, right? I used to think like, you know, the guy in front of the jet who's like, hey, look at me, I have a jet. And I'm like, I would never do an online class. I would never be on Instagram. I, I have all this limiting BS, right? When really it's just an amazing tool, right? And we can all talk to each other across the world. So now obviously I see it so differently. So I decide, fine, I was pregnant. Well, now with my third daughter, I was pregnant. I was like, I'll do an online class. And so how did I do my first webinar? just with a camera like this, no slideshow. That's not my, I don't know how to do that. I couldn't do that to save my life. I do this little webinar, <laughs> just me and a camera, pregnant. It was July. I'm really hot. I don't think I look the hottest. And uh, at the end of that, I said it would be a thousand bucks to do this workshop with me. People would, we would just hang out for several months. I made $147,000 that night. And I was like, holy crap. Like, that's amazing. So then uh, a few months later, one of the girls in the class, she says, you should start a podcast because this is not just about music. What you are teaching is that anybody can take life by their two own two hands and they can make anything happen. And she goes, this relates to everything. And I was like, oh my God, podcast. Now my daughter was actually born. So I had three girls and my youngest was like two weeks old. I'm like, I'm going to start a podcast. So I started a podcast called Don't Keep Your Day Job and Apple features it and they feature it again and we get a Webby nomination and we get chosen as like the best, most inspiring show for that year. And then again, and then again, and I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I get to meet all of these people who I've loved, right? Matthew McConaughey has been on the show and Rob Lowe and the Property Brothers and Priyanka Chopra and Rachel Ray and everybody's been on the show basically. And it's been so much fun. And so for the last five years, I have been getting to do the coolest thing, which is to help other people live out their dreams. And that's my story. Colleen, you've heard that story now, what, 1,050 times? But it never gets old because there's so much magic 
like at every turn, it's like every time you hear it, you just take something different away. So it's beautiful. Well, thank you. And you guys, thank you for sharing all of your beautiful comments in the chat. So let's see if we can unpack that story a little bit because everybody's hero's journey, right? I feel like there's so many clues that are similar clues in all of these stories. You know, I've interviewed now 650 people and I see that there are similar things in these stories. And, you know, it's amazing when my husband and I got married in 2009, he was a lawyer and I was a songwriter and I had already started, you know, doing some of that music licensing, but I don't think anyone in their wildest dreams was thinking, you know, about seven years from now, she's going to be making multi seven figures and he's going to retire. She's going to retire him like, nope. Mm -mm. And it happened. And it's so incredible because I, I realized that all these things that we think like, okay, I can either make a lot of money and sell out on who I am or do what I love and starve. It's like, nope, right? I can either be a mom and be a great mom or I get to have a business. Nope, right? Like we get to do all of this stuff. And now that I have three daughters, I am unrelenting, right? Because I want them to know that they get to grow up and of course they can make multi-millions and of course they can use their gifts and they don't have to trade what feels like selling out for money. Absolutely not, right? In fact, it's so crazy because since the beginning of time, some of the greatest people in history, they made the most money and they weren't selling out, right? It used to be like Michelangelo and Mozart. These people were artists and they were making the most in the world. Why did that change? You know, it's interesting. There's a Broadway show, Rent, which is based on an opera, La Boheme. And La Boheme actually changed the way we see artists because it showed a group of artists who were struggling. And there are artists who struggle. But still, till today, Lady Gaga, who I mentioned, and Justin Timberlake and John Williams and all of the artists in the world, like they're still some of the most wealthy people in the world are people who are not selling out, who are people who are doing what they love to do but we've sort of gotten all of these BS belief systems now about what's actually what and women, they can either choose to love what they do or they don't get to be a mom. It's like, I'm the one who has taken my kids and picked them up every day because it was important to me because I went through 12 rounds of fertility treatment because you don't have to choose. In fact, I want to tell you something. So people say to me all the time, how can you have three children and run a multi seven figure business and love what you're doing? And you don't have a nanny. You never had a full-time nanny. And I say, do you know what makes people the most productive? And I'm going to ask you right now, what do you think makes someone the most productive? Do you think it's time? Do you think people need time to be productive? Do you think they need money to be productive? Do you think they need sleep to be productive? What do you think people need to get the most productivity out of the day? Tell me in the chat. Time, money, food. So you guys are. You speak in my language. Um, I like this. So Rita said purpose. Liz said purpose. Uh, Lauren said deadlines, uh, belief in themselves, energy, knowledge, motivation. Okay, so they did a study at Harvard and they wanted to know what made people most productive. And they, they asked people that question. So they asked them to guess. And people said, well, for me, I know what it is. I need more sleep. If I had more sleep, I know I would be more productive. So they said, great, we're going to put you in a sort of a situation where you get the best sleep and we're going to measure it. Are you more productive? Great, done. Somebody else comes in and says, I need more time. I don't have any time. If you could give me 20, 20 more hours in a week, I get more done. Great. We're going to take away all of your responsibilities just for a small amount of time for this study. You have all the time in the world. Let's see if that helps. Next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. Was there a change in their productivity? The answer is no. The answer is no. Have you ever remembered having an experience where you get no sleep and you pick out your clothes the night before it's your first day of fifth grade or it's the night before your wedding or you're going on a trip to Europe and you've got no sleep and you've had no time. You're like squeezing everything in and you get up for that flight or you get up for that day and you're getting dressed and it's the first day of school and you've got so much energy. You are just ready all day long and all day long. You're like at peak state, peak performance, your wedding day. You give your toast. You're making the dances happen. You're talking to all the people. No time, no sleep, no food even. I remember at my wedding, I literally said to my sister, I want you to get me three tins of Altoids 
and hand me a new tin all day because I will forget to eat and I want to at least have really good breath. So she gave me Altoids and I walked around Altoids because I didn't eat anything at my wedding day. I didn't remember to eat because you're, you remember you go through all the tastings and what is it going to taste like? And then you're like, I don't eat anything at my wedding. I'm talking to people. So thank God I was holding, clutching these Altoids because I knew and I talked to everybody in my life. Anyways, the point is, it turns out that the thing that you need is energy to be productive. And what is even more interesting is that energy doesn't come from food and it doesn't come from sleep and it doesn't come from time the way that we think it does. It can add to your energy. But the greatest thing that's responsible for your energy is this. It's how you feel. Have you ever left somewhere, you talk to someone and you're, you leave a conversation and you feel so bold all of a sudden, you feel so lit up or something else happens. Like you go to someone's funeral and it's somebody you cared about and you're driving home and you just get this hit of like, life is important. I'm going to make this call today. I'm going to make that thing happen. I'm moving. I'm selling my house. I'm leaving this person. I'm asking him to marry me, whatever it is. Like, when we are lit up, when we are energized, we can do so much in so little time. So I say to people, when it came to me, I felt like even if I only had 45 minutes while my daughter was napping, and this is like when I was, you know, pitching music, I'm like, I got 45 minutes. I can make so much happen in 45 minutes. I say to people, you don't need money to start a business. You don't need money to be abundant and make more money. You don't need more time so that you can be abundant. You don't need more anything so that you can be abundant, right? It's energy. We live in an energetic world. And so my friend Bob Goff reminded me of one of his favorite movies, We Bought a Zoo. And I guess the dad's line, Matt Damon says, all you need is 20 seconds of pure courage. 20 seconds of pure courage. And I say, when I'm coaching my students, like, 20 seconds of courage a day, but like full on. You got 20 seconds of courage, you publish that post. You got 20 seconds of courage, whatever is on the other side of it, you just go for it. And part of it is I've always been, and you heard my story, I was not an A student. And so I say to my students, like I want C students because in order for you to make something brilliant, you have to be willing to iterate. You have to be willing to throw spaghetti at the wall. You have to be willing to make mediocre things first, right? Ed Sheeran has this amazing analogy and he's an amazing songwriter. And he goes, you know, my first 40 songs, they weren't all hits, you know? He goes, imagine if you went to a cabin in Vermont and you haven't been there for a few months and you turn the water on and it's like brown water, right? But if you let the water run for 20 seconds, it gets clear. And he goes, and that's how it is. Like, let yourself write first, like write through the brown sludgy water and you'll write better music, right? Do a few podcasts. They're going to get really good. You won't be able to help it, right? Write a few songs, write a few whatever, like spend time being a parent. The first three weeks you take a newborn home, it's hard. It's like a train hits you. You don't know what you're doing. By the time you're in that eighth, ninth, she's, she's 10 months old, you figured it out. You got it, right? Like we just, we, we make great the enemy of good. And it's like, oh, it has to be like this. And I have to be like this. And all people really want is your light, your passion, your energy. Colleen, anything you're thinking right now as we're talking about all of these really beautiful ideas? I just love how freeing it is that you're reminding everyone of that because we overcomplicate it all of the time. We make it that we fight for all of these limitations that aren't even limitations. We've just decided that they're these boulders in our path and they're actually not. We're the ones actually putting them there. And it really does come down to just having the courage, like you say, to be willing to move. And when we can give ourselves that and trust that when we come from that open heart and we come from that space of love and beautiful intention, everybody wins. Like it's impossible for there to be some other outcome when we show up from that space. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And again, I said this yesterday and it feels like a controversial thing to say, although it's really legit that when we're in imposter syndrome and we're in self-doubt and we're in I need to be perfect, it's actually ego. That's egotistical. We think of egotistical as like being arrogant, right? And that's another side of being egocentric. It's like, 
look at me, who I am with my money, with my story, right? Like, cause that's all ego too. But the flip side of being egocentric is I'm nothing. I'm this, I'm that. Like from the soul perspective, we're just so grateful and happy and we want to share, we want to connect and we're all one and everything's good. And you're not judging yourself, right? And you're not focused on the identity based on what you have materially, right? So it is egocentric. And my friend and mentor, Seth Godin, has like this amazing outlook where he's like, if you got more invested in radical empathy for the world, radical empathy, right? We live in a time, look around, like there is such an empathy deficit in the world. And so he said, imagine you stop worrying about yourself and how you come across and whether you're good enough for this. And you're just there to show up, to raise your hand, to be available. Your empathy is what's more important to you. So you get busy, you get busy. You know that your neighbor needs something. You just drop up, so drop off like banana bread by her door, right? Or you, you know that you wanna share this story, whether or not you look perfect, whether or not you have the perfect words, but you go live and you share something because maybe somebody's gonna be touched by your story, right? And you make it about somebody else. He says, imagine if you were a lifeguard and you're sitting next to like the senior lifeguard and it's your first day and he goes to lunch and somebody's drowning. There's an eight-year-old kid drowning. Like, would you hesitate? Would you say, no, I'm not a great lifeguard. He's better at this. I'm going to wait for him to come back. Or would you just throw yourself into the ocean and say, I don't care if I don't have the perfect cross body hold. I don't care if I have this down perfectly. I'm here. I'm available, right? And so we underestimate what it is that people really need. We, 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 we overestimate rather, and we underestimate what we actually have. And so, so much of what we are and so much of what splits the sea, so to speak, in our life, it's from our willingness to be fully available, fully present, raising our hand. And really, again, we don't get, what did I say yesterday? We don't get what we want, we get what we are. And mm -hmm. trusting that, right? Trusting that what we really are was already written in the stars. It was already put inside of us. We're already whole. There's nothing you need to do to impress anybody. The most impressive people they make other people feel impressive. The most impressive people, they're loving. That's the mic drop, right? So I want to tell you a few stories. I told you that today I want to share some stories with you. And I started with my own story. So my friend, Sherry Salata, a lot of you know her already because she's been a part of our community, but she was the executive producer of the Oprah Winfrey show. And then she went on to be president of Harpo. And then she went on to be president of the OWN Network. And this is a phenomenal story because her job, and I'm just going to ask you just for fun, and if you know it, maybe don't share it, but if you want to share it, it's fine. What do you think her job was? Just take a guess. What job do you think she had in the world before she worked at the Oprah show? Where do you think she was working? Does anyone know? Can anyone guess? What was she doing before she worked at the Oprah show? And I know a lot of you know this story already. So the answer is that Sherry was living in Chicago. And she wants, so CJ says Petco. That's a great guess. Mm -hmm. So she was living in Chicago and she had wanted a job at Leo Burnett, which is actually where I got one of my biggest first ads uh, for music for McDonald's. Anyway, that's a big ad agency in Chicago. She wanted to work there and she had a second interview, but she didn't quite get the job, but she had been like working in advertising and she wound up taking a job at 7-Eleven. She was a manager at 7-Eleven because she could not get another job in advertising. And she was working at 7-Eleven and she said, you know what, Kath, I, I just came to this part of my life where I was like, I just know that I am meant <laughs> to do beautiful things in this world. And, and while I'm sitting here at 7-Eleven, I'm going to enjoy selling every cup of coffee to every person who comes into the store. And I'm going to make those floors sparkle and I'm going to treat my employees really well. And she goes, and I just got into that energetic. I just got into that energetic. And so what happens? She gets a call from this woman who works at the Oprah show. And she says, this is Sherry Salata. I was cleaning out a closet and I saw that months ago you applied for a temp position in our like trailer department, making trailers for the show. We need a little extra help. Would you come in as a, is my mic still on? <laughs> okay. She goes, would you come in as like a seasonal employee? And she says, yeah. So she goes to work as a seasonal temp. And she gets moved up and she gets moved up 
And within a very short amount of time, she's doing a lot of stuff there. And one day she's sitting with Oprah and Oprah asked the other couple people in the room if they would give them some time. And she says to her, I want to make you the executive producer of the show. Now that means she would be the quarterback. Like it's her show. That means she is flying the plane. She's landing a 747 every single day <laughs> during the Super Bowl in a tornado. Like that would become her job. And she said, why would you choose me? And she said that Oprah wrote it on a sheet of paper and slid it to her. And she opened the paper and she said, because you know my heart. Because you know my heart. And Sherry said, I got moved up and moved up and moved up. I was so happy to do what I was doing. And she gave me the greatest compliment, which is I'm giving you this role because of the love you hold for me. Because when everyone's running around and I've got so much on my plate, you see me and you take care of my heart. So Sherry becomes the executive producer of the Oprah show, having just worked at 7-Eleven. And then she starts a network with her. Okay. So these are the stories that we have to hear because if I told you to go find evidence by the end of the day of a hundred women who are right now living out their dreams, you could find a thousand. And your subconscious and the stories you might have been told by maybe your mom, maybe your dad, maybe your aunt, maybe your neighborhood, who knows who told you the stories, but most likely there is a belief that it's not possible. You're not this enough. It can't happen. Only if you're lucky, only if you're this. My friend, Jamie Kern Lima, she was working at Denny's and she had her own pain because she had an adoption story, which is a really beautiful story she writes about in her book. And she also was suffering from some pain because she had rosacea on her face and she was always very self-conscious about her skin. And one day she decided to make something that would actually help her skin. And lo and behold, it did. And she started giving it to friends of hers and bottling it in her living room. And she said, maybe I could sell this. Maybe someone would buy this. And she got every door slammed in her face. She remembers going up to meet with Sephora and riding in the elevator and coming down crying because they said, nobody will buy this and nobody will buy anything from someone who looks like you. She wound up getting a contact to somebody who worked at Home Shopping Network. And she went there and said, I would like to be on the Home Shopping Network and sell this makeup. And the guy said, you don't understand how it works. We don't sell advertising on HSN. You have to sell a certain amount of product. And if you don't, you're going to get cut. We're going to take you off the air immediately. And she was like, okay. So she literally maxes out multiple credit cards because he said to her, not only do you have to sell product, you have to have all the product ready right there. So you'd have to have at least 20,000 units of this makeup so that we even can give you a small time slot. And we'll probably cut you because you probably won't sell it because you need to bring models with you. Like no one wants to buy something from someone who just looks like this girl who is a size eight or a size 10 or whatever. Like we need to see, you know, Christy Brinkley looking women. And she went into her car, she was crying and she decides I'm going to trust my gut. I think people actually want to see themselves looking back at them and represented so she decides to max out all that she has, take out a loan, make 20,000 units of this makeup. She goes on HSN. This is her one shot. She's got a, I don't know, an eight minute time slot. That's it. And by minute like three, across the screen, it says sold out. She sold out. She wound up going back on HSN to the point where she was the most uh, I guess, frequent person on the channel. And she wound up selling It Cosmetics for $1.2 billion. $1.2 billion with a B. And these are amazing stories. And they're not the only stories. Like I've interviewed over 600 people on my show and every person has this story. And the reason I do this show is because we reach for the highest branch we could see. My friend Alex 
he told me about his friend who works for Teach for America. And he said, she was standing in the classroom and saying to all the kids, draw what you want to be when you grow up. And some people drew an astronaut and some people drew a marine biologist with dolphins. And this one kid in the back wasn't drawing anything. And so the teacher goes over and says, why are you not drawing anything? And he goes, I don't know what to draw. And so she talked to him a little bit. She walks away. She sees him drawing. She goes, great. He's, he's on his way. Comes back over about 15 minutes later and he drew something. She said, what did you draw? He said, a pizza delivery guy. So she called the mom that night and said, hey, you know, I just thought I would check in. All these kids, I said, draw your biggest dreams, what you want to be when you grow up. And he drew a pizza delivery guy. And I was just curious if you knew why that is. And his mom said to the teacher, I know exactly why that is. Because his dad's in prison and his uncle is a pizza delivery guy. And Alex said to me, Kathy, I realize that we reach for the highest branches we can see. And that's really what we talked about yesterday. Is we are playing in a virtual reality headset that shows you the sky's not the limit. The limit is right down here. And really, the sky isn't even the limit, right? Look at Elon Musk. He's like, let's make an intergalactic difference by the end of the day, right? So I want to spend a little moment with you meditating and really looking at the future that you want to build, the future you that you want to create. So type a one in the chat if you're ready to dive into that for a second. So here we go. Um, what we're also going to do is I'll tell you that on Thursday, we're going to spend time together on Zoom. So you guys can meet me on Zoom. We'll still stream it into this Facebook group if you don't want to come on Zoom. But what will be fun about that is I can probably play some background music and it makes meditation even better. Um, and we'll get a chance to even answer and talk to you guys and maybe unmute some people, which will be fun. But right now, okay, it looks like you're ready. So here we go. So the first thing we're going to do is we are just going to close our eyes. And just, just invite yourself to this moment and just be so proud of yourself that you got yourself here with everything on your plate, with everything that there is to do, that you took the time, that you're here, that you're going on this journey for yourself right now into the future, into what's possible instead of replaying the past over and over again, because your soul knows you are made for more. So now I want you to put your hand on your belly and we're just going to take three deep breaths in to a four count. And we're going to breathe out to an eight count. And again. And by keeping your hand on your belly, you can feel yourself breathing in and out. And last breath. Okay, now I want you to picture your future self. I want you to see yourself sometime in the future and you're sitting on a bench in a beautiful park on a perfect crisp day. It's like 72 degrees and you are so happy and you are talking to a friend and you just are there witnessing yourself and you're telling your friend how happy you are and what's going on in your life and what you're up to and what you're getting to do and who you're with and where you're going. And, and you just look so at ease and everything about you, you're just glowing. I just want you to take that in. What are you wearing? What are you saying? Where are you sitting? Where is this park? Are you in Central Park? Are you near your house? Are you in the South of France? What are you telling her? And now I want you to picture the next scene and there you are like living your best life. What are you doing in this best life? Are you traveling? Are you running a bed and breakfast? Are you with your kids in Cape Cod? Are you working on your own pottery, sitting at a potter's wheel. What are you doing? What are you doing in this best life? What are you doing in this scene where all of your talents just effortlessly are pouring out of you and it just feels so good to get to be you? Just want you to witness that and enjoy that.
And now I want you to picture that there you are and you're sitting on a beautiful porch and you're sitting in this like porch swing and it's a beautiful day. And out comes out of the house onto the porch, walks out you, but the 85 year old version of you. And she sees you and she sits down. And what does she tell you? What does she share with you? What does she tell you that was so important that she's so proud that you did, that she's so grateful that you had the strength, that she's so happy that you had the willingness to have that vision because look where she is in her life. And you sit with her. And you give her a hug. And I want you to remember what she says. And now you take a little walk off the porch and you're walking through this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous area. And there's trees, and there's birds, there's a little brook. And you're looking at the brook and you keep walking. And in the distance, walking toward you, you see this little girl. And it's you. It's you at about seven years old. And she's so adorable. And she's so lovable. And you guys walk up to each other and you see there's a little bench. And you walk over and you sit with her. And you ask her, is there anything that she wants to share with you? What does she love? What makes her happy? What are her dreams? And you listen. And I want you to notice how effortless it is to see how magical she is, how gorgeous, how special, how lovable, how electric. And I want you to tell her, I want you to say, you know, I'm coming to get you and I'm not going to go anywhere ever again. I'm going to keep you with me and I'm going to take you with me on this next part of the journey. And I'm going to listen and I'm going to remember. And you give her a hug. And I want you to tell her how incredibly proud you are of everything that she has gone through that she didn't even know was coming. How amazing she is. And now tell her that you're going to take her. You came together and grab her hand. And you take a walk. And you walk back. And now this time, you walk back to a place, there's a clearing, and you show her what you saw at the beginning of this meditation where you see yourself so happy. And you say, look, look what we did. Look what we're doing. Look how we're living this life. And now we're going to sort of leave this visualization and I want you to feel about eight inches above your head as if there's like this beautiful golden light pouring into you. And I want you to notice the space on the side of your right side of your body, the left side, the space between you and the room that you're in. And I want you to notice how there's this part of you this consciousness, this you of you that extends beyond your physical body in every direction and it's connected and it's being given life by life itself, like eight inches above the crown of your head, just like this golden life force just pouring into you and you are connected and it goes on and on in all directions. 
And I want you to allow yourself to be so grateful in this moment for life, for being loved into life. And feel your heart just open 20% more, 50% more. And now I want you to picture that it's five years from right now and you're sitting in your living room, wherever you live, New York City, Seattle, Paris, and you're sitting in the living room and you look outside the big picture window and one by one by one, there are people coming to say thank you, filling your lawn with their hands on their hearts coming to say thank you for the way in which your life has made a difference in their life. Because five years went by and you stopped believing in the limitations. You stopped believing in the program. You stopped living in that place where you were filled with cortisol, where you were suffering. And instead, every single day that went by, you started to feel that expansion and you started to have that boldness and that willingness to just be generous and be in alignment and giving that force, that light and playing with how it works when you are that tuning fork and you are playing with that music when your receiver is on and you five years, a whole five years of that day after day after day, really feeling what it feels like to feel that wholeness, to feel that expansion. And one by one, you see outside your window. Now there's thousands and thousands of people with their hands on their hearts because of what you have been putting in the world and how it's affected their life. Just take them in. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So now that was a, that was an interesting meditation because we wanted to kind of go on a journey. And, you know, when we talk to our 85 year old self, that's really a way to kind of bypass the ego and talk to our higher self, to really talk to the part of us that really knows what's up. And when we see ourselves in the future, really feeling at ease and happy, there's a lot of truth that just comes pouring out. Like we really know who we really are and what we really came for and what it really feels like to be us. And when we go back and meet our seven-year-old self, isn't it amazing how she's so magical? And yet we tell ourselves we're not enough, we're not this enough. And then you see who you really are. And you say, that kid is brilliant and worthy and worthy and more worthy. And then you think about all this kid wants to do is feel good and share her gifts. Because when you think of all those people standing outside your window, how good did it feel that your feeling of expansion and abundance touched their life? Colleen, what's coming up for you? I mean, no, you and I have done that so many times. It's amazing how every time we can go back in, it's just as powerful. You know what I mean? And I think this is echoing the heart of this work we're getting at is it's always the energetic. And when we can tap into that feeling state, it always feels so nourishing. It always feels so healing. It always feels so transformative. And we can learn to tune into that state more and more and more as we move through our days, right? In our consciousness, in our interactions with people, in the way that we interpret things, the way that we choose what we are going to expect to see in this world, right? That's the work that we're here to do because it it really and truly does get to feel as magical as that little girl when, when she was seven. And we just have to relearn that as, as our default. Yeah. And the reason, by the way, you guys like that, I love to do meditation, right? Is because we can say certain things, right? And we can 
talk about certain things, but when we feel things, when we have a felt sense experience of things, they really start to rewire the way our subconscious feels connected to reality itself. And by the way, that's why, A, we do these free workshops because I can tell that you're getting something from it and so am I, right? It's the greatest gift in the world is to get to give your gifts away. So you're doing so much for me and also you're so receptive and so beautiful and the energy is so good. And so we love to do these and that's why I also do a free podcast twice a week because I wanna put this in the world. And then the reason why we do these 12 week programs is because our life is the result of our habits. And so it's one thing to have these like flashes of inspiration, but how many times have you watched something by my friend Mel Robbins or Tony Robbins or Wayne Dyer and you love it and 20 minutes later, you don't feel good again. And so what I want to do with you is not only to light this wick, right, this week, but part of the reason that we continuously do these in-person, live, hybrid, you get the modules, but you also get us live for 12 weeks is because we want you to memorize how this feels right now. We want you to memorize how to tune that radio so that that music is always playing because I am telling you what you're going to start to tell me three weeks in, three months in, six months later is, you won't believe what's happening. And I'll say, I know exactly what's happening because it's our energy that makes us a match for whatever is in that same station because the world is energetic. It's not 3D. And I know that we're going over a couple of minutes, but we start a few minutes late. So I'm going to tell you one more story and then we're going to do the uh, homework giveaway winners, and then we'll tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. So one last story for you today, because it's such a good one, is Matthew McConaughey was on my podcast, and you guys, I was kind of a wreck for like three days leading. I was like, okay, super normal, just totally normal, like me and him, 90 minutes of just me and him. This is so, so normal. And I read his book in like three hours because I wanted to make sure like I knew it cover to cover. And he was so incredibly gorgeous. And so actually in order for me to get over myself, my ego self, I actually had to just name it. So he comes on the Zoom and he goes, how you doing? And I go, let me just, can you, can I just have a minute? And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever you want. I go, you're so gorgeous. You're so hot. You're so hot. You're so incredibly hot. I was like, one more time. Hang on. You're so hot. I can't take it. And he's like laughing so hard. I go, I just have to get it out there because for me to pretend as if that's not what is just feeling like so big and giant in the room, it's it's weird. Let's just say it. What is it? I go, because if I'm just going to pretend like I can breathe here, then I won't really be able to breathe. So let me just, and he was laughing so hard. I go, I, I, honest to God, I was like, what are you trying to do? Like, you think I can just pull this off? Like I am a normal person. He's dying laughing. Anyway, we have the most amazing time. He was supposed to be on for an hour. He stayed for 90 minutes. My producer was like, ah, he likes you. I'm like, don't get my hopes up. <laughs> anyway, he was amazing. But I want to tell you this story because, and look how cute she is, by the way. Can we talk about gorgeous and hot? Waffles. I can't even take it. Are you going to sit here? So um, this is the story I want to tell you. So everybody knows he's an actor, right? And we all have seen his movies and we know that part, but we don't all know the story of how this happened, which is just so incredible. He was in college, he was going to law school and he just didn't want to be a lawyer. And he, he decides, you know what? I think I finally have the courage. Like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to tell my dad, my like very like tough, like Texan dad that actually I want to be an actor. So he was so scared to do this, but he calls his dad and he's like, dad, I'm dropping out of college. I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to be an actor. And he's like cringing, like, what's his dad going to say? And his dad's response was, well, don't half-ass it. And he was like, all right, I can live with that. I can live with that. If I was going to disown me, don't half-ass it. Got it. So he's feeling so good because he breaks through the limiting garbage. Like he decides, he makes the decision, like, I'm going to be an actor. And so he calls his best friend. He's like, let's go out for drinks. This is the best day of my life. 
I'm out, I'm free, I'm clear, I'm, I left school, da, 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 da. So his friend's like, great. So they go to the top of the Hyatt Hotel and they're having drinks and there's a guy at the end of the bar and he walks over and he goes, what are you guys celebrating? Like, I couldn't, like, your energy is so contagious. And he says, oh, you know, just had a really good day. Just like one of the best days of my life. And the guy says to him, this dude from the end of the bar, he goes, are you an actor? That's what he says to him. And Matthew goes, yep, yes, I am. McConaughey, nice to meet you. And the guy says, cool, I'm a producer and I'm in town shooting a movie and we need a really good looking extra for tomorrow. And I was actually just texting, not, I don't even think texting, emailing some people to see who I could find, but you are perfect. He goes, great. So he says to his friend, I'm going to be an extra in a movie. I've never been in a movie. This is so cool. So he gets, he gets there early the next day and he meets the director of the movie and he meets the guy from the Hyatt Hotel. And he says to him, wow, you really are the perfect person to play this extra role. He's like, cool. He goes, hang on a second. He goes, you see that woman right there? She's one of the characters in the movie. Yeah, he goes, would you ask her out? And he's like, yeah, I would definitely ask her out. He goes, cool. Can I mic you up? Could I just have you just pick her up like in the scene? And he's like, all right, now I'm not an extra. I got a, I got a line in a movie, you know? So they put a mic on him. They say, actually, we're going to put you in this car. You're going to drive up to her, roll down the window, just ask her out. And he's like, okay, I could do that. <laughs> so he gets in the car. He's never done this in his life. And he thinks to himself, okay, who is this character? Well, who am I? What am I about? And he's like, I, he goes, Kath, I just have this feeling like this character is about three things, hot women, hot cars, and good weed. So he goes, they roll action. They tell me to drive. I roll down the window and I said, all right, all right, all right. Because I had three of the things that I wanted. He does the scene and the director says, can you stay for a week? We want to write you in the movie. Can you stay for two weeks? Can you stay for three weeks? He does this movie called Days and Confused. And people can't believe when I tell them this because they're like, well, what do you mean? He's like a lead in that movie. And I'm like, I know, that's the point. <laughs> like he wasn't even supposed to be in the movie, right? He wasn't supposed to be in the movie. He becomes the movie. And from that point, he gets a huge Hollywood agent. His story about how he got a time to kill is also insane. They told him, you're not going to be the lead in this movie. You can't go from dazing and fuse to playing opposite Sandra Bullock. You're never going to get this part. He goes, no, you don't understand. I know this part. I love this part. And he begs the guy to have him audition. And it's Mother's Day. And he calls his mom. He's like, I'm auditioning for a time to kill. They think I'm auditioning for the small role, but I'm going to audition for the lead. And his mom says, remember what I tell you. Don't walk in there like you're trying to buy the place. You walk in like you own it. And he gets the part. He said, Kathy, I remember the night before A Time to Kill. I went, I got a bagel on Third Street Promenade in Los Angeles. Nobody recognized me. Movie comes out, next day, go to the same deli, pick up a bagel. I can't get out of the deli. Like I was famous overnight. These stories, you guys, <laughs> I literally have at least 600 of them because I've interviewed 600 people. And the more time we spend together, I'm gonna tell you more of these stories. But what are you getting from these stories? Colleen, you live this and we talk about this stuff all the time. What do you get every time I tell one of those stories? What is just so obvious? Yeah, for me, it's the reminder that there's magic available for all of us in every moment in the most unexpected ways that we could never script. We could never plan for it. And we move through life thinking we want to, we want to figure everything out and know you know, it's like crystal ball it. When is this going to happen? When's this going to happen? But the beauty of the magic is just being romanced by what shows up for us when we just drop in. And so that's what I love about these stories is just when we're, when we're true to ourselves and what our desires and our dreams are, and we just allow ourselves to be enough, we can be a match for what's really miracles in a way, but they're possible. They're all right there. They're all right there. And you guys, the more time you spend, like I said, I'm going to just tell you story after story after story, but more than telling you the stories, the more you practice it, the more you're in meditation and you start to memorize how good it feels and how much more real you feel when you're connected to what's expansive about you than what's limited about you, 
you start to memorize that, you start to live from that place, you start to think differently, you start to feel differently, you start to do differently, the world will respond to you differently. And then more than me telling you the stories, you're going to tell me your own stories, because this is the way the world works. We live in a vibrational universe. And just like Colleen said, it's amazing how she just said, like, it's so cool how we can be available for what we don't expect, right? They And and the thing that people always hold on to is like, well, I want to know how to, I can figure it out. And Kat, I don't know the steps. I don't know how to figure it out. I'm like, why would you want it that way? Seriously. Like everyone I've ever met, their favorite moments in their life is when they say, oh my God, and you know what happened next? <laughs> why? You want the unexpected. You don't want the predictable. You want a transcendent. You want a mystical experience. That's what you want. You want the moment that blows your hair back where you go, you won't believe what happened. Next thing I know, we wind up on a yacht. Next thing I know, I talked to so-and-so. Next thing I know, oh my God, the best opportunity. That's what you want. Why would you sign up for a life where you're like, I need to know the steps. I need to know the how. I want it to be predictable from whose mind. You want your limited ego perspective to be able to predict the way in which it's going to happen because you think that unless you can see it and unless you can predict it, there's no way it could happen. You're playing from the lowest notes on the keyboard. You're not playing from abundance and expansion. You're playing from scarcity. You're playing from a place where there's self-doubt, where there's ego, where there's separation, where it's all about physical and what you have and where you're from versus what you are. Why would you want to predict it from that place? Why would you want to figure it out from that place? You wouldn't. And so this is why I get so lit up about doing the work I do. This is why Colleen gets so lit up about doing the work that she's been doing for so long, because there's such a better way to show up and experience this thing called your life. And that is why the 12 week program that I do is called Abundant Ever After. And the book I just turned in is also called Abundant Ever After because you are abundant and therefore you can and should be living the most abundant life. Everything in your life should feel abundant. Your relationships, the money that's coming into your life, the opportunities, the way in which you're blessing others, it all is supposed to be, it's designed to be so abundant. And the more that we are who we really are, the more we're a match for all that is truly who we are and what we are, which is mystical, which is transcendent, which is not of this world. It is so much bigger than that. And that's the ride that we're on. So who's excited about it? So I will tell you this, that tomorrow I'm going to tell you a little bit more, right? We're going to keep going deeper. And at some point you will have the opportunity um, if you want to, to enroll in this 12 week program. And just so you know, there are going to be really, 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 really good early bird fast action bonuses. So if you just know, I'm just in, I need to spend 12 weeks with Kathy and Colleen. I need to be in this energy live. I can only imagine where I'm going to be 12 weeks from now. If I've already started to feel something different in the, my, my relationship with myself, then you can go to kathyheller.com slash join and you can grab your spot now, which means you will get all of the early bird bonuses that I'm going to share later in the week. Um, and if you're just saying, I really love what we're doing, then I'm like, cool, because the reason that we're here is because of that. And by the way, we don't even have room for everybody who's in this challenge. We don't take everybody who's in this challenge. So you guys just do your thing and everything's perfectly aligned. Whoever is meant to be in that program to spend three months with us is going to be there. We're going to be there with you and it's going to be perfect the way it's all meant to be. Now, Colleen is going to name out the homework winners, and we're going to have more homework today with a different, really cool, another abundant thing. Actually, I have it on my lap. This is a Barefoot Dreams blanket, and these kinds of things, you guys, just kind of left around your home make you feel like what you really are, which is just so delicious and so abundant. And so, again, you're going to get homework today in the Facebook thread if you go ahead and if you do the homework, which is just putting your little answers into the Facebook group. You will be entered into a raffle and three of you will win a Barefoot Dreams blanket. It is so delicious. Also, there is a giveaway on my Instagram right now and we're giving away a set of gorgeous, it's a whole set of Veluspa, smell, candles. Um, and if you go to my Instagram, that's a separate giveaway, but we love doing these giveaways. So Colleen, go ahead and tell them who won today's giveaway. Yes. So winners of the Tiffany necklace are Stephanie Ann, Christine Gardner Howe, and Karen Knopf. So you'll all be tagged in the comments section of the post as well. And you can just email us hello at kathyheller.com and we will hook you up. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Congrats. 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 
And again, there'll be new giveaways for tonight's homework. Are you guys having fun? Type a one in the chat if you're like, I'm so glad I signed up for this. I didn't know who she was, but I'm loving this. Or I didn't know who she was, but this is even better than I expected. Tell us if you're having fun. We love being with you guys. As you can tell, I always say I'll be here for an hour and it's really hard for me to get off of these calls. We have a whole nother beautiful session tomorrow. And for those of you who are saying to yourself, I really want to be able to do what I love and get paid to do it. We're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow, because again, your abundance is just going to be when you are a match for abundance. And sometimes you're like, yeah, but I also really want to leave my job, or I really want to be at my job, but get paid more, or I really want to do this other thing. And I want to know how I can go from idea to income. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. We're going to talk about how you can get paid to do what you love and how then you never have to feel like you have a job because you make money getting to give your gifts away. And so that is something that I specialize in. I wrote a book on that called Don't Keep Your Day Job. I do a podcast, which is a lot about that as well. And so if that's you, we're going to dive into what are some of the steps that are really key that are going to help you to streamline that process. And that is one of my favorite other topics. So Colleen, thank you so much. Guys, thank you so much. My team is so amazing. You guys are so high vibe. It's incredible to be in a group with thousands of people and all you see is love and beautiful comments. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, do your homework. Come follow me on Instagram and you can join in that giveaway as well. I'm at kathy.heller and we will see you tomorrow.